So we are back for the second part of our Morocco trip and on the Saturday we took a trip south out of Marrakesh through the Atlas Mountains to get here. It's Ait Ben Hadou, or maybe it's Ait Ben Hadou. Um, as an English speaker, I've not really got much to go on here, but look, I know pronouncing a place name wrong is perfect fuel for the well actually crowd in the comments. Much as I want to be respectful to the places I visit and get stuff right as much as possible, if you don't have a native speaker to hand, there's a really good chance you're just not going to get the little details right. For example, this competition is open to non-UK residents only. Correctly pronounce these three place names. Well, ha! The joke's on you. This one's pronounced Fromé. This one's pronounced Worcester Mester Clestershire. And this one is pronounced So look, fine, mere culpa. The English speaker pronounced some things wrong. Yep. Be done. Is it really that interesting? No, but please keep typing. I mean, you're just driving engagement to the channel, so by all means. Okay, this is apparently the second most visited tourist site in all of Morocco. Now, it's not exactly walking distance out of Marrakesh, unless you're accustomed to walking at 60 miles an hour through a mountain range for four hours straight. Uh, there is apparently a public bus that you can get to Uzerate, and then you can hop off early at this junction, I think, and then just hope there's a cab there for the last few miles. Apparently there's some gathered there normally. I wasn't crazy about the multiple uncertainties there, so an excursion seemed like a much better shout. But wait! While I can't remember exactly where, someone dropped some pictures of the Telouet Casbah, and after I wiped the saliva from my screen, I was searching for a tour to incorporate that as well. Now, there are more excursions to Ben Hadou than horseshoe arches in the city of Marrakesh, but ones that include Telouet, yeah, that shrinks the list right down. The only ones I stumbled across at first were about £100 per person. Yikes. However, for whatever reason, if you go on Viator, they have quite a few and all for much less. We went with this one. That face value actually goes down when split amongst four, so we actually did it for about 39 quid each. And this, this is one of the best things that happened to me all year, and we, we covered a lot of ground that year. I guess that's a cue for a call to action. I mean, we've got a number of episodes on the channel and we've got a lot more coming in the next few weeks. Subscribing would be doing us a big favor or maybe just have a flick through our episodes where we take a quick cross section of Albania, Montenegro and Bosnia. So we trailed out of Marrakesh in the early morning chill with the windows constantly misting up. As I mentioned, Marrakesh doesn't spread out all that far, so we were clear of the city in under 10 minutes. There were clear blue skies, except for low clouds on the horizon, which soon revealed themselves to be mountains as we got a little bit closer. Oh, by the way, the footage is gonna get a lot shakier as it was taken from a moving car. If we had somehow taken the time to stop at every beautiful scene, well, let's just say there'd be a missing persons report and a few sets of tearful parents before we showed up around three months later. Eventually the sun emerged over the peaks and lit up the land below and we got a chance to see more of the Moroccan landscape. As I said in the previous episode, there's gonna be a lot of that, watch the previous episode if you haven't already, Morocco is not just a desert plus mountains. Be honest, whatever mental image you have of Morocco, it probably isn't this, with trees carpeting the slopes wreathed in mist. I've got to fight the urge to shoehorn in every clip I took, even the unusual ones, as just scrubbing for the footage again makes me just, ugh, it gives me such a warm glow just thinking back about this day. Now after the first hour, we stopped off at a little truck stop cafe. Remember what I said about the amount of effort and detail that seems to be pretty much the default in Morocco? Well, yeah, this is what a roadside cafe looks like. I mean, I'm not saying it's on the same level of artistry as like the Alcazar in Seville, but come on. Compare this to what you'd get from an independent greasy spoon in a remote corner of the UK. Come on, appreciate the effort, people. It was still pretty chilly, the open fire was a big plus. Quick espresso, not great, but look, they have a machine at least, and they didn't just dunk some instant granules in a mug, so I'm grateful for that. Views were pretty great too, but as you'll see, we are only just getting started. Back on the road, and three minutes later, we stopped again. Like, are you kidding me? Maybe if you grew up in the mountains, this doesn't seem all that special, but I grew up in the south of England. There's a hill or two, but it's pretty flat, so every time I see mountains, I'm just completely transfixed. The road was a bit of a mixed bag. Fairly decent asphalt highway would periodically disappear for a stretch that seemed to be under construction. Uh, speaking of which, I am frankly astonished at how many construction crews the Moroccan government seems to be able to field at one time. I mean, it's great they're developing the infrastructure, but there were diggers pulling out chunks of the mountainside roughly every 10 minutes of the entire drive. Glad to say the traffic kept flowing for the most part. If you were considering hiring a car and doing this yourself, I admire your can-do spirit, but um, yeah, probably don't. 
We were in a 4x4 of sorts, so perhaps I didn't notice the rougher bits, but not only do you not want the stress of trying to take a Renault Megane across this, the driving is creative, let's say. Our driver wasn't exactly Mad Max, but he did have an unnerving habit of swerving into the oncoming lane any chance he got, sometimes overtaking three or even four cars at once, even just cutting blind corners by going wide. This did seem to be the rule of the road. Literally the one rule that if you don't hit anything, the rest is fair game. Still, while this was equal parts amusing and unnerving, it couldn't take the edge off the ridiculous views. We passed through mountain communities, which always begs the question of what day-to-day -day life would look like here. It wasn't medieval, this is still a fairly major road, there was no shortage of modernity, but lots of donkeys loaded up and a surprising number of people just walking by the side of the road. Though I wouldn't have believed it possible, the views got even more ridiculous. I was itching to get out the car and eventually, after this bend, we did. And hey, looks like there will be snow in Africa this Christmas. I think we knew that already though, didn't we? I formed a rather meagre snowball and in an act of playful frivolity, lobbed it at Jenny's shoulder only to accidentally nail her in the face with it. Ooh, sorry, hun, love you. It was unsurprisingly freaking freezing up there. The winds were intense and much as I easily could have spent an hour up there in fair weather, the heated car was very much appreciated. Already the Atlas Mountains had been the best surprise of the trip. I knew the views on the way to the two Casbars were spectacular but I was not prepared for this. Pretty soon we descended back below the line of snow. I didn't capture this exact moment but the turning for Telouette was, no exaggeration, a 180 degree turn in the middle of a main road. Just stop, turn completely the other way and head down a 45 degree inclined dirt track. But it didn't stay dirt track for long, though if I recall that small stretch could have voided almost every insurance you took out on a hire car. The landscape was getting distinctively reddish brown without much vegetation. There were numerous picturesque little towns that I mistook for Telouette, but finally we pulled into the real one. We didn't have long to luxuriate to this one, so I was out the car in a shot. This is Telouette. It's nowhere near as famous as 8 Ben Hadoop, but it was worth the detour 10 times over. At a first glance, it doesn't really give away its secret. It's like, okay, ruined buildings kind of cool, I guess. Mm, okay, yep, yep, ooh, nice view. Oh, whoa, whoa, hang on a sec, back up. Okay, what? So, backstory time. The passages through the Atlas Mountains have long been defended by casbars. Those are fortified houses that would both protect the inhabitants, but also keep some order in the often lawless mountain passes. The Telouette casbar has been significant for centuries. You can see the old casbar ruins on the way in. This casbar, however, dates from the mid 1800s, and this was the passion project of a powerful family called the Glaoui, hence the ornate palace interior. Its last inhabitant in the 1950s, Tami or Thami El Glaoui was nicknamed the Lord of the Atlas due to the power and influence he leveraged from having control of the lucrative movement of caravans for the salt, saffron and other goods. However, he fell from grace after an attempted coup against the Sultan Mohammed V, so his mountain residence was abandoned. Without the glass in the ceiling, this place would probably be a wreck and in the process of collapsing, but luckily for everyone, from 2010 the site has been restored and maintained. And it is just exquisite, a real gem of Moroccan architecture, and you should really make the effort to go there. Oh, and it's 20 dirham in, that's like a pound 50. You could charge 10 times that and it would still easily be worth it. All too soon we had to leave and get back on the trail again, but I was absolutely buzzing to have made it here. This was really special. Considering only an hour ago I'd thrown a snowball, the landscape started looking a lot more like, well, Arizona. Frigid mountains gave way to a deep red, the stratified cliffs, the rocky canyons and incredible contrasts. It was starting to feel a lot warmer, though when we stepped out of the car this vanished pretty quickly, but it was at the very least a beautiful day. All through the drive the mountain slopes had been punctuated by these fertile ribbons of trees as the rivers ran down the bottom of the valleys. They were little more than a trickle in November, but judging by the riverbeds I'd guess they are either swelled by snowmelt or rainfall later in the winter. Once again, I kept seeing a small town in the distance and thinking we'd arrived, only to realise it was just another fortified casbar on the cliffside. Keeping the camera steady at this point was proving a chore, and the windows were pretty dirty by now. Um, if you happen to be near Ben Hadou with time on your hands, there are several other sizeable casbars that you could have wandered around to the north of the site. Then, all of a sudden, round the next bend, we were there. So, 
8 Benhadu. The prefix 8 means the people of, and Ben denotes a son, so this is the village of the people of the sons of Hadu. Okay, and throw a dart at any sword and sandals epic made in the last 30 odd years, and it's probably got Ben Hadou as a backdrop, including, but not limited to, The Mummy, Gladiator, Alexander, Kingdom of Heaven, Prince of Persia, and lest we forget. Ah, just when I haven't used that graphic for a while. Yeah, Game of Thrones did some scenes here as well. The landscape around is quite remarkable. It's a UNESCO site. It's not as old as you might think. Even though it could pass for the ancient city of Uruk, thanks to its mud construction, the oldest parts of the city only go back to the 1600s. Not that it'll take the edge off the atmosphere. It's fantastically romantic to lose yourself in the passages of the village. Now, I researched this long and hard before we went, and much as there were various people asserting one thing or another in chat threads, I could not find out with absolute certainty whether or not there was an entrance fee. So I'll say it loud and clear for everyone in the back, there is no entrance fee. It is free to walk around. We didn't personally encounter this, but there are stories of people placing themselves near an entrance and demanding a fee to enter, and most people don't know any better. You can just look them straight in the eye and tell them that they are lying, there is no entrance fee. The confusion might have arisen from the entrance to this particular casbar, which is 10 dirham, so yeah, that's next to nothing. We didn't go in because of time, but yeah, happy to know now. The main site, as in just to walk around the town, no entrance fee. This sadly also applies to some unscrupulous local guides who will ask you to give them the quote entrance fee which they then just pocket themselves. While this won't be every guide, it is a local problem with people providing uh, <clears throat> guides that are pretty much just a scam. Our driver recommended some guides which we just politely refused. You really don't need one, there's some info boards around in English and you can just google stuff later if you want to know more. I was floating all the way through here. I was busy banking as much footage as I can for later projects, so I wasn't exactly relaxed, but it was just so amazing to be there and seeing it for ourselves, having seen all the pictures before. We eventually headed back across the bridge. Uh, incidentally, as you can see, for most of the year, you can just wander across the riverbed as you like. I later realized we hadn't been around the far angle of the site here, but not that it mattered. We still had a great time. The town itself is not unpleasant. We tried having a quick coffee at this cafe, which had the million dollar view, though I'll be honest, I didn't see an espresso machine on the way in. I was worried they'd serve us instant, so I went for the mint tea, which, I mean, everyone says you need to try it when you go to Morocco. This mint tea, however, was, uh, it was about as bitter as a UK tea bag without milk, which is probably what it contained. I'm not big on the sugar either. Now, look, I feel like I'm gonna get some hate for this, so let me qualify. I'm all for putting mint leaves in some boiling water, but you don't specifically need to go to Morocco to do so. Anyway, my friend said the coffee was okay, though not great. Enjoy the view, tolerate the coffee. That was kind of becoming the theme of the weekend. We got back in the car and we drove with my heart just absolutely full. It wasn't a direct retread of our route in, as instead we headed south. This is close to what you'd describe as desert, but flanked by impressive mountains on all sides. It was far from just an open mass of sand dunes. The journey back was somewhat less eventful. I'd burnt through two camera batteries that day, so I was having to be economical with what I aimed at. There were two numerous beautiful scenes of mountains and open roads to count. I might have complained that we were a bit pushed for time all day. We only got half an hour at Telouet and an hour and a half at Ben Hadou, but in fairness, I hadn't counted on just how long the drive was. It was about four hours each way, and the driver had been very generous with photo stops, which I'm you know, grateful for. My footage takes a sudden plunge in quality as the camera died entirely just short of this cafe, which was a downer because those cliffs were gorgeous. There was also this puppy stealing everyone's hearts. It was, however, a few degrees below the freezing point of nitrogen, so I could barely stand there for more than a few seconds. The driver was kind enough to offer me a charge cable, but most of the spectacular views were now behind us. Eventually, we were pulling back into Marrakesh as the sun dipped down and finally back to the apartment after an amazing day. Just a couple more things for this day. We took an hour for a breather and then headed out to get dinner. This time we were being a bit more adventurous and headed for a restaurant in probably the upper mid-range of Moroccan restaurants. We ate at this place, the Trao Au Mur. It was really good. Normally, Jen and I aren't in fancy restaurants, but here a pretty fancy dinner plus drinks and desserts came out about £25 a head. That's about the cost of a Pizza Express in UK terms. So yeah, big ups Trao Au Mur, just spot on. We took a wander through Marrakesh's streets at night. It was actually quite quiet, all things considered. You might have spotted from the last episode, we hadn't been to the market yet. One of Marrakesh's most famous spots is the Jamar El Fanar. 100% sure that's said differently. It's one of those places you're cautioned to be on guard the most, so we were pretty cagey. Walked around the edge, 
didn't get mugged, no one got up in our faces. We weren't exactly looking to buy anything, so I'm not going to pretend that this was the highlight of the trip, but it would have been weird not to see it at all, and it was, you know, nice to witness. Wound our way back through the streets, slept a lot better that night. You can catch the rest of what we did before getting back on the plane in an episode before this, but here's a bit of an appendix for Marrakesh observations. I don't think I mentioned the language yet. The lingua franca is Arabic, though almost everyone is fluent in French as a holdover from colonial days. However, alongside the Arab ethnicity in Morocco, about a third of the population is Amazir. The common thing in the West is to refer to these people as Berbers, but that's actually from the same Greek etymology as barbarians, and Amazir definitely deserves more of a voice. It has its own script, which appears on some official signs. This is the symbol, and though there might be some underlying tensions around the ethnicities, it's mainly just worth knowing that Morocco does not automatically equal Arabic. The Amazir have an incredibly rich history and culture, and it's just well worth looking into. All of that aside, there's a fair amount of English there too. We made it by all weekend with just some English or a sprinkling of high school French. You'll be fine. There are cats everywhere. Do not touch them. To be honest, once you've seen them eating the raw meat thrown to them by the butchers, you probably won't need too much convincing to leave them alone. It's sort of sad, but they do look like they'd stab you given half a chance. In fact, animals have a pretty rough time here. Look, I know I keep saying this on episodes. This isn't like normally a particular thing of mine, but please, please, do not use the horse carriages. I have scarcely ever seen more unhappy horses than here. On a lighter note, the coffee, yeah, so we've kind of already telegraphed this. We didn't find a single coffee spot that really stood out all weekend. In fact, this espresso at the airport was narrowly the best one I'd had in the 48 hours. That was a puzzle. I really thought that Marrakesh would have more of a cafe culture. Look, there's a fair chance we'd just been unlucky. Quite plausible the best places are reserved for the new city. Maybe I'm just a decadent Westerner. I'm not protesting too loudly. I had the most incredible weekend. Somewhat mediocre coffee didn't take away from that. Regards guidelines that we in the West might find a little restrictive. So yeah, Morocco is quite a conservative Islamic culture, so I didn't pack a crop top for this holiday. Uh, for what it's worth, just walking past the average man or woman in the street, I really didn't get the impression that Islamic jurisprudence is foremost on their minds. These are just folk. Going to the shops, riding a moped into a crowd of people, standard stuff. So with just a cursory check on what is expected in an Islamic culture, then just behave fairly politely, you will likely be just fine. As I mentioned, being in a group was a big plus. The most hassle we got all weekend was not directed towards our wives. Funny enough, it was people constantly calling me a rasta or offering me weed, which, yeah, well, that comes with the territory when you have dreads. If you're out in public, I'm not advocating being obnoxious, but you can just not talk to people when they try and get your attention, you know, especially in the marketplaces. If you don't turn around, they often just assume that you don't speak English and leave you alone. We had a few people helpfully pitch in with unsolicited advice about directions. Oh, yeah, you can't go that way, it's closed. Yeah, it turned out the road was 100% not closed, so I think they were just trying to mess with us. So yeah, just blank the time wasters. Don't accept any unsolicited help. If you really are in need of help, ask the shopkeepers. There are actually quite a few police stations around. You'll be just fine. So that was it. I'm pretty proud of everything we covered in the short time we got, especially considering the road trip. I feel like we got a pretty good cross section of that part of Morocco, as much as you could hope in 48 hours flat. Huge love to Sam and Carly for joining us on this one. The music in the background is ours. We made an EP specially for this episode, as we do for every episode. It's available on bandcamp.com. If you want to support the channel, that's the place to do it. Next episode, we're heading just a little north into the Mediterranean to see some of the highlights of the Balearic Isles. Otherwise, we'll catch you very soon.